Genesis chapter 21. We're going to study this tonight on this topic. Let's make a deal. Can y'all see that? It'll fan through. Let's make a deal. Chapter 21 of Genesis, verse 22 and following. If you would stand in reverence to the reading of God's word tonight. The Bible says, and it came to pass that as a time that Abimelech and Phil, uh, excuse me, Phil Shaw, the ca chief captain of his host, spake unto him, uh, to Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now therefore swear unto me, and Abimelech saying, Hereby God, that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abimelech reproved Abraham, uh, excuse me, and Abraham approved Abimelech because of the well of, uh, wa well of water which Abimelech's servant had violently taken away. And Abimelech said, I was not who has done this thing, neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it, but today. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What meanest thou these seven ewe lambs that thou hast set them by themselves? And he said, For these seven uh, ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, and they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. And wherefore he had called the place Beersheba, uh, because there, were, uh, there they swear both of them. Thus he, they made a covenant at Beersheba, and Abimelech rose up, and Phil called the chief captain of his host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove at Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistine lands many days. Once again, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the very privilege of reading your word. And God, I know that sometimes we read it, it just doesn't set upon our hearts and our minds. And that's why you've called us together collectively as the body of Christ here to study the word to show us approved. And I would pray, dear God, that you would not only give us the truth of what we're studying, but God, show us how it applies to our lives. And Lord, how we may become stronger Christians and in our sanctification grow closer to you. So Father God, lead God and direct. We ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, you may be seated. Let's make a deal. Usually when we hear that, we think about some type of game, but I want to tell you throughout life, there's deals going on all the time. There's certain things that I don't mind doing as, as dealing a little bit. Uh, you know, we, I've shared with y'all, we have a little booth down at the flea market and it's amazing. Our prices are marked and yet people want to come in and make a deal with us. They want to dicker with us. I had a guy come in there yesterday and, and want to buy a wallet. It was $8.99 and he says, $8? I said, no, sir. He said, well, make a deal with me. I said, okay, 10. It's not my first rodeo, okay? Uh, I don't like to dicker. That's just not who I am. You ever went and bought a car and have to make a deal with them? And you banter it back and forth, banter it forth. I tell you, I've got a good way of working that out. I go in and I do my research before I ever get in to buy a new car. And I know which type we're looking at. And, of course, then you have to go with the coloration for your wife or something like that. Color really doesn't matter that much to me. But anyway, I know what I'm going to pay when I get there. And I tell the salesperson, because usually they'll come out and greet you and all, and I, I say, listen, you got one opportunity to make this deal. I'm not going to dicker with you. I'm not going to have you go back and forth to the service manager or the sales manager because I know what y'all do. Y'all go back there and you let the people sit out here for 45 minutes and sweat it out while you eat, call, drink coffee and eat donuts. And you come back out and say, well, the, service man the sales manager says we can't do that. This is what I'm going to give you for that vehicle, yay or nay. And every time I do that, usually it's a no. You know, well, you, you, we can't do that. And I said, fine, no problem. I'm not angry. And I'll leave. And before I'll get home, they'll call me on the cell phone. And we can get close to it. And I'll tell them, don't insult my intelligence. You knew what I would pay when I got there. I, it's, it's, it's a game, and they know what they can do. But there's deals in life, and I, we see that tonight with Abimelech and with, with uh, Abraham. And what we see to start out with is Abimelech's request for a deal or for a treaty there, verses 22 and following. The Bible says, when it came to pass, at the time that Abimelech and, and Philcol, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. And that's a, a wonderful statement to see, that they know they're dealing with a man of God. 
But yet they also have some other understanding about Abraham because they've had other dealings with Abraham. But they know that God is with him. Why? Because God spoke to Abimelech when he went into Sarah or took Sarah from Abraham because Abraham had half-hearted lied and said, this is my sister, when really she was his sister of his, uh, not by his dad, but by not, he didn't, not a biological mom. But uh, you remember as I said that a half, a half lie is a full sin. It's not necessarily a half truth. It's a complete sin. So they understood that he did not always deal straightly with them. So then Abimelech says unto him, even though they knew that God was with them, he says, swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my sons, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, that thou shalt do unto me in the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham says, I will swear. Well, Abimelech had a fear of Abraham's potential to harm him, uh, to harm his dynasty and to harm his kingdom. Obviously, Abraham has grown by this time. Remember that Abimelech gave him cattle and food and, and money and everything else and says, you go anywhere in my land and you stay. And obviously he did. And, and through that time, his, his family, his, his holdings are going to grow to where Abimelech had some tight fear from him. Abimelech didn't fully trust him. And that's understandable. Once again, Abraham has, in my opinion, flat-footed lied to him just straight to his face. So even though he says, I bless you, and I, and I know you're, that God is with you, and I know God has blessed you, I trust you about as far as I can throw you. But I want to make a deal with you. And my deal is simply this, that um, you don't ever harm me. You don't harm my sons. You don't harm my son's sons. You do, you do according to them as I have done unto you. In other words, you treat them like I treated you. I treated you pretty good. I gave you cattle and sheep and oxen and handmaidens and, and, and slaves, bondservants and money. And I want you to treat me the same way. So he wants to make a deal with him. And Abraham says, I swear to that. Yeah, I'll do that. But see, Abraham's still Abraham. There was something else going on that Abraham knew about that Abimelech didn't know about. Notice there in verse 25, it says, And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of the well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. So Abraham makes this, this, he has basically the upper hand about this well. See, water was a scarce commodity. Water was a precious commodity. These are, are nomadic people. They're out there in the desert. And uh, so water's a big thing. And and Abraham had the upper hand on this in a way because he had dug that well. Remember, he had been out there. And he, they'd land, uh, uh, Abimelech said, just go where you want to go, do what you want to do, be at peace, just don't cause me any difficulty. So Abraham went out there and he dug a well. And when the well got, was dug and the water was there, then Abimelech's guys who herdsmen come in, and they would run off Abraham's herdsmen because they wanted the water. Well, Abraham knew he dug the well. He also controlled that well because even though Abimelech's guys would come in, Abraham's guys were still close by. And they could have caused a bunch of fighting and a bunch of fussing. So now here's Abimelech trying to make a treaty, a deal with Abraham. And Abraham says, I swear, I won't, I won't mess with your family. I don't mess with your, your dynasty, your kingdom. But I got a problem. I got a problem that it's going to be just a complete deal. There's other things that need to go along with this. And Abraham explained to Abimelech what was going on. Abimelech says, I, I didn't know anything about that. Neither did you tell me, neither have I heard of it. Well, Abimelech pleads innocent to what his herdsman has done. Uh, but it's innocence by ignorance. Doesn't that sound familiar? Sound like Washington, D.C., doesn't it? I saw on the news today that Miss Nancy Pelosi, who was what, Speaker of the House at one time? She says she doesn't know if she ever made any promises. What politician has never made a promise? They'll promise you everything and render unto you nothing. But Abimelech pleads innocence by ignorance, and then he places the blame back on Abraham, said, well, you didn't tell me about it. Now, that does sound like Washington, doesn't it? They just got caught very recently in, in uh, monitoring phone calls and now Google and Facebook accounts and everything else. And they're pleading, well, I didn't know anything about it. Well, you should have told me. Well, now they're telling them, and they're still saying, well, I don't know anything about it. Are we that naive, folks? Yeah, they've been doing it. 
I remember years ago when we went to Virginia to pastor, Annette's brother was in the service. He was in the Air Force, and Tony had a very high security clearance when he was at McDill Air Force Base and Barksdale Air Force Base, and actually when also when he was in Germany at Wiesbaden. And when we moved to Virginia, they brought him in and questioned him, why is your brother-in-law moving to Virginia? Why is he getting close to Quantico? I was in the mountains of Virginia. Quantico's way over there on the coast. And I thought, how in the world did Big Brother, the government, know about Buddy Wasson, a little peanut coming from Mississippi, Georgia, Mississippi, then to Virginia to pastor? How did they know about me? But they want to know, what, they question him, what is his intent? He's a preacher. He's coming to preach the word. But what I learned from that is that Big Brother knows a whole lot more than we think Big Brother knows about. They watch us. So Abimelech pleads innocent by ignorance. Now you probably know in your heart that somewhere down the line, Abimelech's herdsmen went to him and say, Abraham's causing us hardship. They won't let us drink water our herds and it has caused this big fight. You know he wasn't totally innocent. When he placed the blame on Abraham, that's what we call in psychology transference of anger. He, tra he turned around and transferred it right back to Abraham. But you didn't tell me. Nobody let me know. This is the first I heard of it. <laughs> How many times you ever heard that from people? You know they're, can I just be honest? I know this is being recorded, but they're lying through their teeth. This is the first I heard of it. And you can look at their face and say, nah, you've heard of this a lot. So Abimelech's trying to make a deal. He requests a deal with Abraham. Then Abraham turns around and makes a deal with Abimelech. Notice verse 27. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and he gave them to Abimelech. And both of them made a covenant. They made a treaty. They made a deal. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What meanest these seven ewe lambs that thou hast set by themselves? And Abraham said unto him, These seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Abraham's deal is that he gives a ceremonial covenant gift of sheep and cattle to Abimelech to appease him. said, listen, let me just, if you want me not to harm your family, to, not to mess with your sons or your son's sons or anybody else, I swear to God that I won't do this, and I'm going to give you some cattle and some sheep and everything just as a way of proving that I'm a man of my word. But then he also takes seven ewe lambs, these female lambs, and he sets them aside, these little ones. And, and uh, this is, uh, Abimelech says, what's this all about? And this is like a deal within a deal. And this is really where he says this is a sign of friendship, not as the first animals were a sign of a treaty. He says, I'm not doing this for a deal. I'm doing this as a way to say that on my honor, I'm giving you these seven lambs, to say that I dug that well. Does that make sense? This is my way of proving that I dug that well. I'm going to give you seven fine, precious little lambs. You know the ones that you'd put on a spit and turn him over and over and over and baste him with butter and eat him with mint jelly? Mm. That's what he's saying to him. I'm giving you the good stuff. By the way, I don't like lamb, but anyway, I thought y'all might like that. And by accepting these animals, Abimelech accepts Abraham's account of the event. By Abimelech accepting these animals, he said, okay, Abraham, you did that special above the deal that we already had, the treaty where you, you said by your word, then you proved it by your actions, and now you've even given a little bit extra. I believe what you're telling me is true, that your men didn't start this, that you dug that well, it belonged to you. And my herdsmen may not, they may have went in and overstepped their bounds a little bit. But the giving of these animals also showed Abraham's wealth and strength for bargaining. In other words, Abraham was probably, he probably could have did what he wanted to do. But he wanted to make peace. He wanted to make things right. Remember he did the same thing with Lot. Remember they had the same problem over the watering and the grazing and Lot's, Lot, Lot's flock and Abraham's flock and the herdsmen. And Abraham told Lot, you take what you want. You can take the choice. You can take the best. I'll take the worst. Don't let us fight. Wanted a covenant, a treatment. Let's make a deal here. Let's get it right. 
And then immediately following that, we see Abraham worshiping. Notice there in verse 31, the Bible says, and wherefore he called that place Beersheba because they swear, uh, they swear both of them, that is Abimelech and Abraham swearing together. And they made a covenant at Beersheba and Abimelech rose up and foul cold or feel cold, um, the chief captain of his host, and they returned to the lands of the Philistine. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistine land many days. Well, after they made this deal, after things got right, Abraham did what a man of God should do. He went and gave God the glory for it. He went and he, he, he praised God and he worshiped God and he, in this place called Beersheba. And the word Beersheba speaks of a wall of seven, but particularly in this instance, it speaks of a wall of oath. The wall of an oath. In other words, right here, right where we were standing, me and Abimelech, when there was a problem and a worry, we settled the issues. He was worried about his sons and his legacy and his son's sons and his dynasty and his kingdom being hurt by me. And I swore before God that I would make things right. I would treat him as they had treated me with much kindness. But we had a problem with our herdsmen, and we settled that issue right here. So this place was a wall for an oath. And then Abraham planted a grove. And that grove was there to have a resting place. In my research, and it's kind of kind of funny, they're out there in a, in a nomadic desert type place. And most people believe, most biblical scholars believe that this, this uh, plant, these, these, the, the grove that he planted was the massive evergreen type trees. And they would grow to 60, 70 feet high, providing a lot of shade, providing a place of rest, providing a place that would be conducive to worship. And there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Elohim, God everlasting. Abraham worshiped the Lord God there. And after that, he said, and Abraham sojourned in the Philistine land many days. And the, the importance of that is that even though the Philistines would become a mortal enemy against the Hebrews, against the Israelites, Abraham freedom, had freedom to go anywhere he wanted to go. Why? Because he made a deal. And then he gave God the glory. Now the part that I had shared with you before, and this is basically the truth of what, we, what happened in their life, that I was going to do a little bit different tonight, is this. I try to find an application to scriptures. How does this equate to our lives? How do we tie all this together? And I tell you, I have really struggled. I've done this before, this message before, and I struggled with it then, and I struggle with it now. How does this come together? Well, I think it, it happens in two ways, and I'm going to ask you to give your opinion. This is the part that I usually don't do, but I'm, except maybe like on Wednesday nights. But I'm going to ask you, how does this affect you? How does this mean to you? And, and you think about that. But I think about this fact that, that we have dealings we have to deal with all the time. Sometimes there's that that innocence of ignorance that comes up. It's not always true, but it comes up. But I tell you, every day in life, I have to deal with things, and sometimes we have to make deals. You got to give a little to get a little. You got to try to make peace sometimes and, and work out treaties and covenants together. And I do that on a daily basis, and you probably do too in different aspects of life. You ever had to intercede between your spouse and your child? Make a little deal with them. Listen, mama's having one of those moments. You're causing that moment. So I'm going to make a deal with you. I'm going to let you live another day. <laughs> if you make up with your mother. Y'all been there? So you, you know what I'm talking about. We have to make these deals. But sometimes... People have alternative thoughts about their deals. They have, they have something else, some other objective they're trying to get. But what we're really seeking for is peace in life, isn't it? The peace of God. But how often when we have to deal with these deals do we turn around and give God the glory for it? How often do we really worship God when we do these things? How does this affect you tonight? How does the Word of God speak to you? Anyone have a, a thought or a comment of how this would speak to them? Looking at Abimelech and him dealing, Sandy? Mm-hmm. 
Okay? Mm -hmm. I see that, and I'm going to comment on some of your statements. Her statement was Abraham dealt with things more uprightly than Abimelech or than the Philistines did. And that's how we should as Christians, we should deal with things uprightly. But Abraham done lied to Abimelech. But he made it right. You know, it's amazing to me that he made it right later in this covenant, more so than he did. He left in shame, and Abimelech blessed him for saying that Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. And now he's go, he went the farther. He went the, took the high road and made it right. Yeah, you're very much correct. And we should be doing that. We should be taking the high road. And we should be dealing with things as Christians, not like the world deals with things. And then we should be praising God whether we like the outcome or not. Very good thought. Someone else. Mm -hmm. There was a, the Philistines were the mortal enemies of the Israelites, but something happened in between. Mm -hmm. The Israelites left. They went to Egypt for 400 years. Mm -hmm. And so, sure, the Philistines felt like they could come back, they could take it there, but the, the folks they made the deal with were gone. Mm -hmm. In other words, we've got to stand firm. When we stand, we've got to make sure we stand on the truth, and regardless of what the consequences might be. Mm -hmm. It might not always be our back. We might have to face it head on. And not always be easy. Good observation. Good observation. In our society today, I think they would say, well, you have to have some type of documentation to prove that you did own that after you left. And all Abraham had was wells that he dug, tabernacles that he had built. But where did them trees come from? Remember that? Remember that grove? It wasn't there beforehand. I planted them trees. That place where you're getting rest, where you're getting shade, that's where Elohim was worshipped. The everlasting God. So I reckon that would have been his documentation once, they, once the children of Israel came out of, out of captivity. But you know, when they came out of captivity, like Sam was saying, that the Philistines had really became their mortal enemy, even more so than they were right now. Anyone else? Well, let me just end with this. Be careful in your dealings. There are those out there who may seem to be proper and upright, and their dealings may not be so. I cannot tell you how many times, even in church life, I have seen where people have given over to the ugliness of life and done horrible things in church Dealing with things. We've got to be very, very careful that we don't become in agreement with that. See, even in this, Abraham said, uh, you know, I'll make a deal with you. I won't harm your sons or your son's sons or your other sons, but we got a problem that's got to be rectified or we're really not going to have a deal. How many times do we go to people that, or there's problems and we'll go and say, okay, let's just let bygones be got bygones and we never dealt with the issues. They're still going on. You know, it, it can happen even years later. Old hurts can arise and problems not be solved. I think that we need to stand, like Sandy said, and even stand. We need to take the high road and be upright about it. And then we need to give God the glory for it and worship Him. We're all in agreement? Let's pray.